You're listening to Breaking the Bottle Legacy with Molly Watts, episode 51. Hi, I'm Molly. After a lifetime living under the influence of family alcohol abuse, spending more than 30 years worrying about alcohol and my own drinking, believing I had an unbreakable daily drinking habit, I changed my relationship with alcohol forever. If you want to change your drinking habits, then Breaking the Bottle Legacy is for you. My goal is to help you create a peaceful relationship with alcohol, past, present, and future. Each week, I'll focus on real science and using your own brain to change your relationship with alcohol. Nothing has gone wrong. You're not broken. You're not sick. It's not your genes. And creating peace is possible. I'm here to help you do it. Let's start now. Well, hello and welcome or welcome back to Breaking the Bottle Legacy with me, your host, Molly Watts, coming to you from a pretty sunny and cold Oregon, still working without a furnace around here. So we'll be great if it doesn't get much colder, but it is sunny and beautiful. So that is happy. Hey, I just want to jump on real quick before my guest is here today and ask you to check out my private Facebook group. It is called Alcohol Minimalists Change Your Drinking Habits. And there you will find all sorts of resources and tools and accountability and support. You can find it on Facebook. Just search for in groups for alcohol minimalists and you will find us. So I invite you to please come over and join us in changing your drinking habits and creating a peaceful relationship with alcohol become an alcohol minimalist. So today on the podcast, I am delighted to be speaking again to William Porter. Many of you who have been trying to figure out your relationship with alcohol have undoubtedly read William's books, Alcohol Explained and Alcohol Explained Too. And I talked to Will the first time back in January of 2021, when I was first launching this podcast, I was smack in the middle of dryuary. And gosh, I was like, just so excited to speak with him because he was a really big name in this work at the time for me to actually talk to. And now it's just nice to revisit that conversation to revisit some of our shared beliefs and also to ask him about some of his own decisions and and kind of his view on my work as an alcohol minimalist. So I think you will really enjoy hearing from him again. I always enjoy speaking to him. Here is my conversation with William Porter. Hey, Will, happy to have you back on the podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me. Hi, thank you for inviting me back. It's so good to see you. It's so good to just have you back here on the podcast. I think I mentioned to you our episode, our first episode is probably one of my most downloaded episodes. So I really appreciate. Yeah, I know. Right. (laughs) Well, (laughs) nice to hear. Yeah, yeah. it is good. And so um, I wanted to just catch up with you. And first of all, just share a little bit with what's been going on with you this last year with regards to alcohol explained and alcohol explained to you. And I know this year you've published a workbook. Yes. So absolutely. So it's been all go. So did the workbook, um, I then moved on to another book, which I'm co-writing with Annie Grace, but this one's oh. about nicotine. Wow. So that's, co-writing that's kind of, with Annie Grace. Yeah, yeah, Brilliant. exactly. So that, that, that's <laughs> going to be coming out. I think current indications are it will be fall next year. So we've got wow. just over a year to go. Wow. Um, so that's that's all in the wings. That's kind of the manuscript's done. I'm just doing some rewriting on it. Um, and also I'm now working on an online course as well. So I've tried to amalgamate everything that's in alcohol explained one and two Mm -hmm. and kind of cobble it together into a, into a course, an interactive course. So people can sort of go online and work through it. So it's kind of a mix between a workbook, a book and an audio book. Yeah. So it's proving to be be horribly big task, much bigger than I envisaged. (laughs) I don't don't know how that's going to, when that will be in, you know, coming out. I feel Um, for you. You and I talk, we, 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 even in our just emails back and forth, because you and I both have full-time jobs outside of 
all this work that we do. And I think we yeah. might be the, the, you know, we're kind of alone in that respect um, mm. where the, this isn't the full focus of our lives. No, no. And it's, yeah, it's fitting it around everything else, isn't it? And, and as things get bigger and bigger, everything, everything seems to get squashed a bit more. Yeah. So, I can't imagine yeah. for you because that's a big deal. That's a big deal. I mean, Annie Grace is pretty much the biggest name in, you know, at least here in the U S I feel like. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so no, it's, yeah, it's been, it's been a, yeah, it's been a, ch a challenge. It's been, it was okay when I was working in an office because I'd have an hour on the tube on, on the underground, the subway to work and an hour on the way back. So I always had two hours a day to work. Mm -hmm. But then when um, lockdown kicked in, I, saw, I even lost that. So it's become <laughs> <laughs> more and more difficult to fit things in, to be honest. Well, it's yeah. amazing, but you're, you're, yeah. And we talked a little bit too about your, your Facebook group has gotten really large really, I think really I, big yeah. yeah I thought like I think I remember back at the beginning of the year when we were when I was looking at it maybe it was around I don't know in the low thousands and now it's like up over 15,000 yeah it just it's flown up I found it funny enough I, I saw a post in there I can't remember when it was but it was only a year or two ago when I was saying wow the group's at 3,000 yeah and it's that's now I mean. at, yeah nearly <laughs> sort of knocking on the door of 16,000 now so it's yeah it's big it's really big. big. It's big. Almost well, a that bit too must, big, but yeah. yeah. But it has to make you feel good because you know that the, I mean, I don't know that you ever set out to, to be, uh, you know, a, a person of interest in the alcohol sobriety <laughs> world, but um, definitely that's happened. It has. Yeah. I always, I kind of, I'm always happy sort of sitting in the background trying to pick things apart and think about things and sort of do that side of it. And I'm not overly good at like publicity or self promotion right. or anything right. like that. So right. it's kind of, it's a bit of an odd mix for me because as I say, I'm happy kind of sitting there thinking about things and trying to unpick addiction. Right. Um, but yeah, the other side of it is a bit more, yeah, a bit more alien to me. <laughs> well it's working for you well it's working yes. so just keep well, at it <laughs> something's happening yeah absolutely yeah well one of the other reasons that I wanted to have you back on is because I was listening to our first interview like I said and um, it was when I was really new launching this program really new launching my podcast my book wasn't finished yet my book wasn't out um, and I was back and i funny enough, I was smack in the middle of dryuary. So I think I told you, I'm like in this middle of this first month of me being, mm. you know, not drinking for 30 days. And, um, and now my, my evolution in my journey has really even still con it continues to evolve and has continued to evolve throughout this year. And I feel very convinced and very firm in what I do now. I consider myself an alcohol minimalist. Mm -hmm. And I stick to those low risk guidelines. I don't drink more than seven standard drinks in a week. And I don't drink in consecutive days. And I don't drink more than three drinks in any one, in any one sitting. And, and I do have multiple alcohol free days in a week. And I do, I tell my, my followers, I take one alcohol free weekend, at least per quarter. And I take an alcohol free month per year, which is mm. dryuary. And for me, I have found that I am completely at peace with that. I don't have any, you know, I don't have the negative side effects, at least to the extent that I feel like it's, um, that I am worth, or it's, it's mm. or I'm willing to do the trade-off of being completely alcohol free as far as like the, my sleep and things like that. I feel like I have, you know, a balance, a balance. Yeah. yeah a balance. Yeah. So, um, and I wanted to explore that more with you because I know in your, in, in alcohol explained too, at least you, you're pretty clear that you don't think that moderation is possible, but you also say it's more for people that maybe were heavier drinkers in the beginning. So tell me a little bit about what you think about that. Yeah. So I suppose there's a few points there. I mean, one would be a question for you really. How do you, I mean, do you, how do you find your sleep and energy levels the day after you've been drinking do you find they're the same as normal or slightly lower and I know you're talking about a balance so I'm not suggesting that yeah 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 
do, yeah, well, do you like find... I, yeah, I don't feel like I have a real, any, any, you know, serious uptick nor any serious downtick, but that's also, again, like I said, I don't really like for me to even have three drinks in a, in a particular evening would be a, 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 unusual. Is, yeah, a very yeah. unusual. So, you know, it's really probably on any occasion would be one drink or potentially two at the, at the, I see. Okay. You know, so I, I'm not I think, like, yeah, I think for me, certainly a lot of it was, um, picking apart the reasons why we do drink and so for me I started to get to the stage where I didn't see any benefit to drinking Mm -hmm. so I think that was one of the big parts for me in that if I saw alcohol as attractive or desirable in any situ like in a certain situation I kind of would would then want it in other situations but for me to 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 have just made a decision not to drink anymore I think has made it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And also I think for me, there's a sort of a simple physiological side. I mean, as you know, because I I speak about it in both Alcohol Explained and Alcohol Explained too, about when an alcoholic drink wears off, it leaves a kind of an unpleasant, um, out of sorts kind of twitched up feeling that needs then another drink to relieve it. Um, So for me, I think when you reach a certain level of drinking and it's i kind of see this for, for any addiction because for any drug even so, so, so take something for example like smoking which most people consider to be addictive mm-hmm. even smoking has a take it or leave it stage when you first start not many some people do but not many people start smoking 60 a day on day one and can't do without it right. what most people find with smoking is they smoke when they're out with friends so they start smoking in the evenings at weekends and then they can go a week without smoking um and it takes a while for the addiction to kick in. Now, for me, that addiction in inverted commas, the meaning of that word mm. is when you reach the stage where your conscious and subconscious brain interprets the feeling as withdraw- of withdrawal, that unpleasant feeling as I want a drink or a cigarette or whatever to relieve it. Mm-hmm. Because ultimately, that's the chemical side of addiction it's when one dose of a drug wears off, it leaves an unpleasant feeling that needs another dose to relieve it. And when your brain catches up with that, for me, every, every drink creates a desire for the next one as it starts to wear off. Mm-hmm. So for me, I just found it easier not to have anything to do with it anymore to sort of to kick it into touch entirely. Yeah. And I, and I respect that. And in fact, you know, I thought about that after the the fact, I don't know if I know your, I know you went to AA at some point, but I, did you, when you stopped drinking, did you just stop cold Turkey all the way? Yeah, I did. I, so, so to explain though, I, I was never a regular drinker. Mm, you so were I never, a binge, yeah. I was a binge drinker. So, but, but when I say a binge drinker, I mean, my binges were getting more and more ridiculous because what, I mean, we spoke a bit about not like yeah. waking up in the night when you were drinking. And what I discovered is when I drank, I'd wake up and feel really anxious and couldn't get back to sleep. And then I'd have a drink and manage to go back to sleep. Mm. Um, but that kind of crosses a line, quite a bad one, in that you, as soon as you wake up, you start drinking again. So when I was binge drinking, I was literally drinking until I fell unconscious and then waking up and starting again. Yeah. And my last one of those went on for about five days. So it was, you know, it wasn't binge drinking as I went out for a couple of nights and got quite drunk both nights. This was continual drinking for five days. Um, and at that point, I stopped completely Um and utterly I'd been to AA for a stint previous to that Mm. and I found it was I found it was really useful to have that human contact with people that had been through it but what I struggled with I think was the the steps and the kind of the philosophy behind it yeah and we've talked we talked about that and I agree with that completely the you know one of the things that I uh, in watching my mother struggle with her addiction was just the idea that she was powerless. And I, like, mm-hmm. you know, that part to me was always really hard to uh, digest. And I just don't believe it. And I still don't believe it. And I don't, I believe that people, you know, you took control, you had the power, you did what you needed to do, and you chose to be alcohol free. And I always tell people, 
in this, in my group and on this podcast, I know, I'm not telling anybody they should go out and drink alcohol. That's not the, the message. No. <laughs> I think that in fact, but I, I do want to make sure that the, that when people include alcohol in their lives, they're doing it in a mindful way and that they're doing it with the, if they're going to include alcohol in their lives, they do it with the very minimal risk that they can. And so mm-hmm. what I fear when I, and to some degree, and I know I've actually, you know, I did a podcast on kind of dissecting a little bit of Annie Grace, because sometimes I feel like the messaging has gotten, has gotten very convoluted that there is only, you know, that the only answer is she, she, in the book, she kind of takes you into a journey and thinking that you, that you, might want to drink again, or you have control over it and that you are in control, but ultimately the message is you can never drink again. Mm, And so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so my fear with that and my, the reason that I want to get a message across to people that choosing to include alcohol in your life and making that decision in a mindful way, and even in a low risk way is certainly a better way of doing things. If you're not, if you are, not paying attention at all whatsoever to what Mm. you're doing with alcohol right now. Now, obviously as a, as a binge drinker, and I think I said that to you before, I wasn't a binge drinker. I've never been a binge drinker and I never really, Mm. I I was a regular drinker. So I was somebody that was drinking all the time, drinking daily and still passing the the guidelines for Mm. low risk drinking. I was drinking, you know, in excess and drinking heavy, what would be considered heavy drinking, even though I didn't get to the point where I was blacking out or not remembering, you know, anything like that, Mm. but definitely to a point where what I appreciated most about Alcohol Explained and about your work was the connection between the science and the neuroscience and the neurotransmitters and how alcohol impacts us as it's dissipating from our system and that, that reflex in anxiety. And I'd never Mm. really associated my and, and at drinking three to four drinks a day, it was very noticeable to me when I stopped doing that, how much mm. better I felt in terms of not, you know, not having that rebound anxiety. Mm. No, I completely agree with you. I mean, for me, it's about giving people knowledge mm-hmm. and then really what they do with that knowledge is up to them. So I believe it or not, I don't you know, most of the time the people that come to me you know they are clearly better off for stopping drinking yeah but for most people I think there's a lot of um there's a massive knowledge deficit with alcohol Mm. yeah people don't understand the dynamic of how it works if someone is drinking that's as far as I'm concerned that's entirely their decision and nothing to do with me but I think they do need to have the knowledge to make sure they're making the correct decision Mm -hmm. because ultimately, you know, say for example, I don't know, I want to buy a new car I'm, you know, everyone's buying electric cars these days. So I need to buy an electric car, but I don't know anything about them. If I just go out there and buy an electric car, it could well be completely the wrong car for me. So I have to do a lot of research. I need to know what they, you know, how long it takes to charge them, how expensive they are, how far they can run all these different things. So I can choose the right one for me. To make a decision, you need to have knowledge and accurate knowledge. And mm. for me, that's what it's about. It's it's about having people understanding what alcohol does and what it doesn't do. So you strip it down to exactly what it is, give people that knowledge, and then really it's up to them what they do with that knowledge, whether they continue drinking or they stop drinking or they cut down on their drinking. But I mean, as you said, you know, in my books, I, I do kind of I'm fairly clear that abstinence is the best option. And it certainly certainly was for me anyway. Yeah. And I don't like I said, I don't begrudge anybody that I if for some people being alcohol free is the best option. It's the option that's going mm. to be the most peaceful for them, you know, and while I definitely lean towards being more alcohol free than I do, including alcohol in my life. And I think that's, you know, people, when I say alcohol minimalist, it means that I have taken alcohol out of the equation enough so that it isn't something that I have to 
I, I don't make a decision. And I know you can, you've talked about this before too, just kind of that decision fatigue where you're constantly, you know, will I, or won't I, or will I, or won't I, for me, there's never a moment when I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to go in and have, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to go overboard with alcohol. You know, mm. I'm not, I'm never going to, that's not something that's on the table. It's never a situation where I think, oh, if I drink one drink, I'm going to keep wanting to drink another one because I have a lot of knowledge in the deficit. You know, the, the, the science is very clear. There is scientific therapeutic benefit for alcohol if you keep blood alcohol content level of 0. 0.055 and below. And really for most people, that's going to be one drink or less. Anything over that and all the detrimental side effects of alcohol start to kick in. And the further down that slope you go, the higher those those offset, you know, negative activities are going to or, or aspects are going to be. So mm. for me, I use the same exact kind of mindset theory or the things that you think or the knowledge that you use to maintain sobriety, I use to maintain alcohol minimalism, you know, and it mm. is the same. But I think people sometimes when they hear, I think the com the the problems with moderation become people thinking that they're going to still be able to drink to excess and <laughs> include alcohol in their lives. I just yeah. don't think that's ever going to work for anybody. No, you've got to, you've got to change your perception of it to even, even get there. I think yeah. because I, so, so since I stopped one time I had, um, a flu or something and I took what yeah, is known as night nurse. This, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there was alcohol in it. So it was the equivalent of having like a glass of sherry or a small glass of wine or something. Um, and it didn't cause me to drink again because I didn't particularly like the effect of it. I regretted having it. I wasn't very well at the time anyway. Right. <laughs> um, so I didn't really notice it, but so, so theoretically, I know it is possible because I have done it. I did have that alcohol on that chart, that, right, that occasion, right. albeit by accident. Um, but for me, I think it's almost like a catch 22 because if I had wanted it, mm -hmm. then I would have wanted it on other occasions. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? So it's kind yeah. of, yeah, as I say, almost like a catch 22 thing. I think the only people who can safely moderate are those who actually don't particularly want to drink in the first place. Yeah. So that's interesting. Cause I think about that. I, and I know you in your books talk about whether or not people can really do this. I truly like, I'm totally good having a drink and not having another drink. And I don't feel like I'm like gritting my teeth, you know, white knuckling it through the event. I'm not like, there's not like willpower. And mm. there's, and the reason that's there now, I really truly believe is because of all the education that I've done on alcohol. I have reprogrammed my subconscious. I've reprogrammed how I see alcohol. I don't see it as like, so when I'm doing that, even if I'm having a drink, it's not the focus of my, of of what's going on, you know, before mm -hmm. I think I probably put a lot of attention and a lot of focus on what I was going to drink and how much I was going to drink. And if I was going to a party, you know, it was all about like, oh, oh, they're serving beer and, you know, they're, they're serving mm -hmm. beer and wine and it's free. Okay. Woohoo. Right. I mean, we're going to go and we can drink to our little heart's contents. Now I don't like that doesn't, you know what I mean? That's not anywhere near my thought process. My thought process is, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I, you know, I can't wait to go. I want to see my friends. I can't wait to enjoy the music. Does that make sense? So that the, for me has been pivotal in changing my relationship with alcohol is figuring out the thoughts that I had that were driving the desire to drink. And I think that's mm -hmm. kind of what you're talking about is you've, you know, for you, you've changed your desire because you've got a, a lot of thoughts that that you have so that you have zero desire, right? That's, that's what you, yeah. but your thoughts, really, yeah. your thoughts have really driven you there. Your thoughts and your thinking have really created that feeling. And I think for me, that was one of the things that I didn't really understand prior to doing this work was how in control I was of creating the thoughts. And also, and I know you talk about this a little bit in alcohol explained too, about like in, in that chapter on moderation, like how you set yourself up, right. And what your expert, or, or maybe it's in the conclusion, I think is where you're mm -hmm. talking about how you're, if you're, you know, positive thinking about how this kind of idea, right. Of putting it into just practice is, you know, how you perceive what's going to happen 
when you go to something or do something, if you choose to see your life without alcohol as miserable and awful, and you're going to have to, you know, it's going to be drudgery, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah. That's, that's, that's kind of what's going to create. That's what you're going to create, but you can choose to, to frame it in a completely different way. Yeah, that's it. I think that's one of the key things because, you know, we talk very, well, we've talked about the, you know, the, the physiological, the chemical side of it, but obviously that's just one part because the other part of it is I, I refer to it in the books as craving. Yeah. Um, and it's that, you know, essentially a very strong desire for something, but it's that almost obsessing about something. So the, the thought of a drink enters your mind um, and then you're just fantasizing about it, thinking how great it will be. And then usually you move on to then the possibility of having one. And what you're really doing is torturing yourself with it. Yeah. Now, that's a big part of addiction. Um, and it's I don't think people appreciate how big a part of addiction it is. Mm -hmm. um, I was watching something the other day um, and they were talking about heroin addiction now, we generally think of heroin as being something that's really, really highly addictive. Right. But what they were saying is a lot of people who have serious accidents or illnesses go into hospital and they're essentially given heroin. It's, it, you know, it's the same thing. In fact, it's usually much stronger than what, what people buy on the streets, because what right. people buy on the streets is often cut with all sorts of other things that aren't heroin. So actually people can go into hospital for a few months, weeks, whatever, be given regular doses of heroin. Now, a lot of them do struggle with addiction when they come out, but many yeah. of them don't. And actually the reason for that is, it, well, in my view, it, it's that craving process because in the same way that when you start, like we talked about smoking, that, you know, you will have a withdrawal from nicotine. It will be there in the early stages but crucially, what is missing is that it triggers the desire to have it, mm -hmm. because when nicotine wears off, it leaves an unpleasant feeling that another cigarette and, there, and another dose of nicotine will relieve that. So it will make you feel lots better. But there's lots of things in life that make us feel a bit uptight and not very good. And most of the time we just get on with it. Right. So in the early stages, that feeling is there but we don't interpret it as I want a drink or I want a cigarette or I want some heroin. So we don't start obsessing with it and craving. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that part of it is absolutely missing. Yeah. That's, I don't, so that's, yeah. Yeah. No, I think that I actually did it. I, I did a podcast not too long ago and I was talking about a study and the study was talking about, uh, it was, it was, um, uh, it's talking about naltrexone, the drug that people mm, yeah. take yet, yeah, right? And it's supposed mm. to help uh, tone down the cravings. That's one of its one of its claims. Yes, is that it, it impacts or blocks those opioid receptors in the brain. And so, but what was interesting about the study was that what wasn't clear, and that's just one of the things I think is is that when people are physically dependent, right? One mm -hmm. of the one of the characteristics of being physically dependent on alcohol is having cravings. Okay, so. But what they didn't say is, well, it is, is it the craving that comes first and then the physical dependence, or is it the physical dependence that then creates the craving? And I think that's the, you know, there's a, there's a, a question there because it's, is it like, it's like, what happens first? Is it the craving that leads to somebody becoming physically dependent or when they are physically dependent, is that how we're getting the cravings? Does that make sense? Absolutely. <laughs> and I think certainly for me, the answer is it can go either way around. So take myself as an example. So I would start drinking Friday lunchtime, Friday evening, Thursday, whenever it was. And when each drink wore off, it would, my brain would interpret that as I, I want another drink. I want another drink. So I would keep drinking, drinking, drinking. Um, but for me, I could never do my job with a hangover. I've always needed to use my brain to do my job. And I always knew that. So what I would usually do is go into work in complete pieces on Monday and not really be able to do much of anything or even ring in sick. And then Tuesday would be the same. And I'd end up doing three days work, uh, five to my week's work, basically, Wednesday, <laughs> Thursday, Friday. Right. Um, but then by the time Friday came, you know, I caught up on sleep. I felt a lot better. I had no physical withdrawal, but I would still start craving because the process is that withdrawal, all that will do is put the thought of a cigarette, 
heroin, alcohol. Let's talk about alcohol because obviously that's what we're talking about at the moment. That physical withdrawal mm -hmm. will put the thought of an alcoholic drink in your head. Mm -hmm. Okay. And people who've been drinking regularly, their brain will interpret that as I want to drink, but that on its own is quite a minor thing. It's what comes after in our conscious mind that is important. And that's when we start fantasizing about it and really mm. wanting it and obsessing with it. So in that situation, it's withdrawal creates the thought, which creates the craving, but actually you can miss the first two completely. Well, not the first two, the first one, because you may be someone like me who doesn't who didn't drink all week. Mm -hmm. So you may sit down on a Friday and you'll have no physical withdrawal, but you still want to drink yeah. because Friday is your night for drinking. And instead of, so say, for example, you go out with your friends, you're not listening to the conversation or enjoying their company. You're thinking about having an alcoholic drink and you can't engage in what you're doing while 90% of your attention is taken up with that unpleasant kind of mental tantrum that is the craving process. Mm -hmm. So when you have that drink, it releases you from that thought process because you no longer have to think about should I, shouldn't I, because you're already doing it. And then it frees you up to do what you should be doing, which is enjoying the company of your <laughs> friends or TV or whatever it might be. Right. So for me, craving doesn't necessarily need the physical side to it at all. You can mm -hmm. crave something that you have no physical dependency on. If, you know, if you're sat there thinking about it, wanting it, unhappy because you can't have it and unable to engage in what you're doing, being watching TV or relaxing or a meal or socializing because your attention is taken up with wanting something, so that you, is the craving. Yeah. Okay. So I talk about this in my book. I talk about undoing the urge and talk about urges and cravings and things like that. So what I'm not sure about with you is whether I hear you saying, is the craving the the fantasy part or is the craving the feeling that the feeling of desire? What happens is, so if you're in a chemical dependency situation, mm -hmm. when one drink wears off, it leaves that unpleasant feeling. So that unpleasant feeling is physical and it's mm -hmm. caused by a chemical imbalance, which is itself caused by the previous dose of the drug. So that needs another dose of the drug. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that unpleasant feeling is just a feeling. It's how we react to it, which is to want another dose. So mm -hmm. I kind of see it as a completely separate process I think it helps you've got the physical withdrawal which is an unpleasant feeling which will mm -hmm. be relieved by another drug another dose of the drug got it um but the actual the may the backbone of addiction if you like that craving feeling that's our fantasizing about it that's when you sit there and you can't think of anything else apart from a drink that's all you're thinking about and you're miserable because you can't have one um be it you know you're out with friends or relaxing after a hard day at work or whatever it is Okay. So it's interesting because though so I look at it this way. So I, I totally hear what you're saying. I agree with that. I agree with the, the physical wear off and that's, you know, that, the, that for, for people that, that are physically dependent, especially that the having another drink will relieve that unpleasant, you know, feeling. And that's that triggering of a, a physical craving, right? Mm. The, uh, the thing that I think is interesting. So you talked about that, about how you would be, you know, you'd go through the whole week. So you weren't physical, right? There wasn't a physical urge there, but there was that, that craving would come the fantasy, right? The thought process. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the part. And I, and I still, I believe that's true for most people, whether they're regular drinkers mm. or binge drinkers, there comes a, whether if you have an established habit of drinking at a specific time of day at a specific, you know, if you always drink at the rugby match, if you always drink, you know, wherever it is, if you're, you know, or being at the soccer match or at the football match, you're going to be, or it, you always drink at a holiday event. If you always drink, you know, it, it after work on Fridays, you, and you do that over enough time, right? For me, I drank pretty much regularly every night, came home from work. It was the way I would unwind. That was just mm. my pattern. Um, and I know for other people like you, it, it's more like the weekends, right? And it was to excess, but regardless of whether it's to excess or not, once you establish a pattern, your brain, because that's the way our brains are designed, they're designed to commit things to habit so that it's mm -hmm. uses less energy and that our, you know, our brains don't care whether or not it's good for us or bad for us. They're just like, oh, okay you do this repeatedly. You've done this repeatedly. This is how we deal with, this is what we do when we are off work. This is what we do when we are confronted with negative emotion. We drink. Mm. And 
So that, that pattern, that habit pattern in and of itself will create a craving or an urge. You're triggered just by the time of day, by the time of, you know, by the, the circumstance. And mm. that's, and then that's where I focus on recognizing that unconscious urge, that unconscious habit and applying conscious thought to it and logical thought to it and say to myself, okay, oh, there it is. I see you. I see you urge. I see this has come up. This is coming up because I've trained my brain to want alcohol in this situation. Mm. I know alcohol won't actually do what I used to think that it did all the time. It doesn't actually help me un <laughs> relax and unwind. It actually creates a rebound anxiety effect. So I have a decision here. You know, that's where the conscious part of craving comes for me, not so much the fantasizing, but also just being able to recognize those subconscious urges. Mm, I think the, yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's right. They're definitely there. Um, and that, yeah, I think that that's, definitely correct it, it's trying to get to grips so so for me having that being able to counteract those was about not wanting out alcohol anymore because for me i know a lot of people try to avoid triggers i struggle with the concept of avoiding triggers to drink in a society where 87 percent of people drink right where you open a book or put on the tv you know watch something on netflix or tv social media songs there's so much about alcohol right all of these things put the thought of alcohol into our mind the key is what we do with that thought so i, I probably think about alcohol 90 percent of my waking hours right but I never, ever think about the possibility of having a drink. Right. So that for me is the difference. I just, it just doesn't interest me anymore. I think of it more in the abstract, trying to sort of pick it apart more and more. Yeah, I definitely, I mean, I agree with that too. Obviously you and I both spend a lot of time talking and thinking about alcohol. If I, yeah. if I, you know, if our drinking um, habits Reflect. reflected how much time <laughs> yeah. we talked about it, it'd be pretty bad. Nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> terrible. Um, so, uh, I, before we go, I want to ask you one last thing and that's, uh, cause I was reading this and alcohol explained too, again, uh, just before our talk. And, um, and I think it's important because I really want to, the way that I see this, the way that I live my life now, and I know you do too, this whole notion of one day at a time. Um, again, don't want to ever, you know, whether it's AA, AA or anything that's working for people, if it's working for you and helping you change your drinking habits, then, you know, go, right? It's all positive. Yeah. But I struggle. I don't, I really don't, uh, I don't encourage people to look at it. You know, I don't like that whole mindset, that one day at a time mindset, because I think it sort of makes it sound as though this, that, that creating a new relationship with alcohol is going to be awful. You know, it's going to be painful and it's going to be hard and it's going to be miserable. And my experience has been completely the opposite. Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely echo what you're saying. If something's working for people, keep doing it. And, you know, it's better to be not drinking than drinking. However right. you do that or drinking less, whatever that might be. Um, but I also always say that recovery should be, it's not a fixed menu. It's a buffet. You mm -hmm. should be going in and picking the bits you like from, you know, alcohol explained, Annie grace, whatever. If you come across a book or a philosophy that works for you hundred percent, then fantastic. But other than that, you pick what you need from different, different parts. Um, having said that, the, the problem I have with one day at a time, there's several issues with it. The first and most obvious one is, if you're making a decision to change your relationship with alcohol, you have to reconcile with that. So for me, I've quit drinking um, and I'm never going to drink again. And I need to be happy with that decision. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm living a kind of a half life at best. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if you make a decision, my life is better off without alcohol. 
why would you go one day at a time? And I can see how people, and, and I do recommend it sometimes to people in the early days, just to get those first few days, those crucial days of sobriety under your belt. So you start to feel a bit better and you get a bit more on top of things. But what you've said is exactly correct. It, it shouldn't be hard work. It shouldn't be a slog. And, you know, one of the reasons behind alcohol explained is to try and give people the opportunity to quit drinking without it being hard work or to be as easy as possible. Um, and I think taking one day at a time, it's just saying it's so difficult. It's so right. impossible to do. I can only go a few hours and then I have to keep lumping these hours together, together, together to get through things. Um, and really, for me, that wouldn't have worked. If, if it had been like that for me, I, honestly, I would still be drinking again. I, you know, I'm eight years sober in February. I wouldn't have got there if I'd had to struggle through eight years, you know, 365 right. times eight, whatever, <laughs> whatever that comes <laughs> out with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's just, for me, that's no way to live. You should, you know, we only get, you know, whether you believe in life after death or reincarnation or nothing, whatever it is, we only get one shot at this particular life we're living. Yeah. Um, and you want to be doing the best life you can and getting the most out of it and kind of limping from one day to the next kind of feels like you're doing something wrong. Yeah. No, absolutely. You and I agree on a lot. And we've always said that it's a, we, we agree on a lot and I never want to steer people away from that. Um, I, um, my drinking habits have been born out of, a, a desire to cut back originally. That was, you know, the very first reason that I ever took on this work in the first place is I mm -hmm. knew I needed, I knew that the the relationship I had with alcohol wasn't working and it wasn't creating a life of happiness and peace for me. And so I hope that people use science. I hope they listen and I hope they, they get a clearer message than the, the messages that are seen on TV and, you know, advertised everywhere. There's, there is real knowledge out there. There is real information about alcohol and you need to take it. You need to take it, get work from the buffet as William says, yeah. and, um, figure out what's going to make, you know, help you create the best relationship with alcohol you can have, whether that's complete sobriety, whether that is sticking to low risk limits and becoming an alcohol minimalist, you know, I got to say either one of them, I think works great. And, and, and I yeah. appreciate you. I appreciate you taking the time, Will, and being back on the show. It was really great seeing you. And so there's no coffee explained book coming anytime soon. A few people have asked me about I caffeine. I, don't, <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't quite got, to, to be honest, I, you know, I've cut out coffee, but I still drink quite a lot of tea. I've managed to kind of, I'm kind of working my way towards it. I managed to, I think, I, I, I tried to go caffeine free a few months ago and it just, I lasted a day or so. It's, it's yeah, <laughs> I well, know I should do, but I haven't quite got there yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not happening. Like I said last time, girls out here in the Pacific Northwest got to have her coffee. So yeah, that's yeah, not going to no, happen absolutely. anytime soon either. So not quite there yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I will of course link everything in the show notes on how you can, uh, find William find alcohol explained to you. And does the book with Andy Grace have a, is it just nicotine explained? Or is it it's, it, no, it's, I think it's the working title is this naked mind nicotine. Um, so yeah. And as I say, it's supposedly it's going to be out in, um, autumn next year. So just over a year or just under a year, Fantastic. Um, but it's being traditionally published this one with penguin. Um, and it's a lot slower than self-publishing. Yeah. Right. Uh, so yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but also bigger. So congratulations. Yes, well, yeah, congratulations a, very much. Um, <laughs> you know, you. hopefully we'll, uh, you know, after you're a big time, regular, traditionally published author, <laughs> yeah. hopefully you'll, you'll have time come to come back, back and talk to Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Glad to. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, William. Thank you for listening to Breaking the Bottle Legacy. This podcast is dedicated to helping you change your drinking habits and to create a peaceful relationship with alcohol. Take something that you learned in today's episode and apply it to your life this week. Transformation is possible. You have the power to change your relationship with alcohol now. For more information, please visit me at www.mollywatts.com.